Girl, that's scary. Showing my so now I'm like nervous. I'm like, I'm gonna tell her that I'm not doing it, but yeah, I know she's gonna. Well, and you know, until they can figure out a long term plan for you know, this, this patient, they need staff that are going to be able to take care of the patient. So you can kind of see it from both sides and the patient needs care. If you're unable to do the care, then they would have to get somebody that can until this patient can be transferred or another arrangement can be made. But the thing that you have to understand that a lot of people don't don't understand is that um, nursing homes cost money. They're not free. So an assisted living may be costing her about $3,000 a month. A nursing home is going to cost double or triple that. Mm -hmm. So, and they have to pay for that out of their pocket or out of the, the patient's um, funds. It's not covered by anything. So as a family trying to come up with $6,000 a month, I mean, would you be able to come up with $6,000 a month to take care of somebody? I don't even make that much. <laughs> right, right. So because of that, and I'm not excusing the situation, but because we have to be aware of all aspects of this. It's not as easy as... Um, you know, this patient isn't a good fit for here, get them out. They have to find a nursing home with an opening, but they also have to find the money to pay for it. Mm -hmm. And it's in a lot of cases, much more advantageous for the family to leave the patient where they are. First of all, it's a familiar environment to them. They know their co their caregivers. They usually get better attention you know, so the family's going to be very resistant to moving that patient out. Does that make sense? Yeah. So because of that, I'm going to get started here. Because of that, you end up with a situation where you have patients that aren't necessarily appropriate for assisted living, but we are kind of, I don't want to say stuck with them but we are providing a higher level of care than what we really should be. And there's a lot of things that, that play into that, a lot of factors that go into that decision. And it's just not really as easy. Uh, hold on, guys. It's just not really as easy as... Um, I just don't feel right lifting her because I don't feel safe like not just for me but I feel like I'm gonna drop yeah dangerous. I don't want to do that to her hey Miss Patty yes um so you said the CPR uh, is today after class yes okay yeah we'll be going over that today too yes. Okay. All right. Yeah, it sounds to me like she has just declined. She's not really appropriate for that, you know, that um, setting, but they may not have any other options right now. So if, if it were me in that position, I would tell the owner or whoever you know, you're reporting to, um, Hey, listen, I'm, you know, I've got a back injury. I'm really concerned about injuring myself or the patient. You said that you don't have any trouble with this. So can you show me your techniques? What, how are you doing this so that I can find, you know, adapt your techniques so that I'm not getting hurt and I'm not hurting the patient, especially if it's a small facility, because they don't want you to file a work comp claim. Um, they can't afford that small facilities are, it, it's very, very expensive. So they, their best interest is for you to not get hurt. <laughs> yeah. So if you're uncomfortable, you know, 
you may have to leave that position and find something that's, you know, a little bit more comfortable for you. I really wish in healthcare, hi, YouTube world, we're having a conversation. I really, really wish in healthcare it was as simple as patients always end up exactly where they're supposed to be. Everything is paid for. We don't have to worry about the money aspect of it. Caregivers are properly trained so that, you know, people work together. I, I wish I could say that. I can't. Um, a lot of times patients start out in a facility just fine, but then they decline over time. They're no longer appropriate for that facility, the level of care, but they don't want to move or the family doesn't want them to move or the facility doesn't want them to move because then they lose that revenue. So there's a lot of things that are going to play into this. It's not necessarily always what's best for the patient. Everything has to be taken into account. Does that make sense? I, I wish I could tell you it was a perfect world. It's not. All right, so you had chapters eight and nine over the weekend. Do you guys have any questions about what you read? Any questions? Let me go ahead and get your scores. Janelle? No, pass for eight and then for nine, I got one wrong. Okay, do you have seven for me? No. Okay. Elizabeth? Um, the, sorry. That's okay. A unit two, I got at 80. Okay, I, I, no, I don't need the units, I just need the chapters. So, and I actually need all of them for you. Um, so chapters two, three, so it's going to be on page 182. The unit tests, those are more for you to just make sure that you learned everything you needed to learn in that unit. Okay. So 182, 100. Thank you. Um, 183. 93. Uh, missed one. One. Sorry, I forgot the. That's okay. Uh, 184. Okay. 100. 185. I missed two. Okay, 186. I missed one. 187. 100. 188. I don't have that one. Okay. All right. Uh, let's see here. Kiera. Paula. 100 for both. Thank you. Paula, do you have one, three, four for me by any chance? Okay. Neftali? Yes. This is 188. Okay. 19. Okay. And 189? Didn't do it. Didn't do it? That's okay. That's fine. Isabel? 95. Thank you. Andrea? Cassidy? Giselle? Lacey? Are we going chapter eight? Eight and nine. Um, 100 and 100. Thank you. Quinny? 85 and 95. Very good. All right. Anybody have any questions for me? Anyone have any questions for me? Okay, last chapter tonight. You're going to be reading chapter 10 and answering those questions. Remember, you're going to be bringing the yellow book back to us on Wednesday. Wednesday is graduation. It goes fast, doesn't it? It goes really fast. All right, only one class left, guys. We have Wednesday. And that's graduation day, so you're almost done. One class left. Good morning. If you haven't registered for the state exam, you probably want to make sure that you do that soon. That way you're testing 
relatively soon after graduation. You don't want to wait too long. I've seen students that wait too long. They don't register for the test right, you know, during class or right after. Life gets in the way and a month goes by and then you start to think, oh, I've got to practice more because I don't remember what I learned. I'll go back to my book and then I'll register. And then life gets in the way. And before you know it, it's six months later. And now you have no confidence at all. So you put it aside and say, well, I'll get to it later. And then two years go by and you realize, oh, my gosh, I need a job. And I have no certification. And then you end up back in my class again. So I would prefer that you take, as, as much as I love having you here, I would prefer that you take the exam get certified and that way you have the ability to work okay um i registered after class can i show you the email just to make sure it's like approved sure because i'm a little confused sure no problem <laughs> okay yes i just finished today okay because this gave me a long time <laughs> because i have to do it completely for one little thing this is not going through I have to make again oh. and make sure I wait for the three days for the email. I wait for other three days for the email. So somebody helping me. Um, when I finish to doing, I think I'm doing everything correct. I get it all the email. It's pending. Just I have okay. to call. Pending is good. Yeah, pending is good because they send me to the application ID and everything. Okay. So but the payment not going through. I had to call for make it by phone. Oh. Now they say wait for the so for the email confirm, confirmation, mm -hmm. and they say probably this is gonna take like forty five days, but probably because they're gonna answer me before than that. Yeah, they they tell you it'll take that long, but it doesn't. It doesn't. On the bottom, so what you have to understand, most people don't know this. Okay, Prometric, the company that does our CNA testing, that's not all they do. That's not all they do. They do certification exams for something like 80 different industries. So construction, real estate, yeah. coding, um, heavy equipment. I mean, just all kinds of testing. So the CNA part, this much of the company, okay? This much of the company. Company is huge. CNA, this much of the company. So when they give you those answers, remember that everybody that calls is not for CNA. Everybody that calls is for every industry that they test for. So they give one answer up to 45 days. That doesn't mean that it's going to take 45 days. On your registration paperwork, what I handed out to you, on the bottom of page six, it says, if you do not receive your authorization to test in 10 to 14 days, please contact us. Okay. So 45 days is a standard global answer. That doesn't mean that for CNA, it takes that long. CNA, it's much shorter. Okay. So we're going to go by what they tell us on the CNA specific paperwork. Good? Makes sense? Most people don't know that about Prometric. They do certification testing for many, many, many industries. All right. Tomorrow is the game show. So at 11 a.m. on YouTube, I will go live and I'm going to go over 15 possible testing questions. And we'll discuss the answers so you will know why the right answer is the right answer. And you can compete for prizes. One of the things that I give away is the CNA card game. That's first place. Um, and we have some other prizes as well. But that will be tomorrow. We're doing the live game show on our YouTube channel. So you have to go to YouTube to join. Okay. CPR today, 2 p.m., so um, if you are deciding to take the CPR class today, we're going to end at 1. You'll have from 1 to 2 to go get your lunch and then come back at 2, and um, I'll take payment. You don't have to pre-register. You don't have to let me know you're coming. Just show up, and I'll take payment, okay? 
It's $45. This is your last chance for $45 CPR. After this, it's $55. Uncle Sam has to take his cut too. Remember, there is tax on that as well. How long is the CPR class? Four hours from oh. two to six. Okay. Yeah. Um, it's, what's that? Oh, I thought that said two eight. It does say two eight. Does it say two eight? Yeah, that's why I was wondering. Oh. <laughs> hmm. Okay, so 2 p.m. <laughs> 2 p.m., so I have to change that. Um, so, yeah, I'm not going to be here at 2 a.m. <laughs> change that to 2 p.m. But yeah, for, this is the last day for you guys for $45 CPR. After graduation, it goes up to 55 so if you don't have it, you don't need it for the test. You don't need it for the class. You will need it to work. Almost everybody requires CPR certification. But you also need it just to be a good human. Like everybody should know CPR. And it's a no-stress class. You don't fail it. You stay until you get it. Okay? It's not a pass-fail class. You get your card that day, but I'm going to make sure that you know what to do in an emergency. It's not a pass fail. It's a pass remediate. Okay. All right. And then of course we have the workplace personality quiz so that you can find your perfect fit. Um, and a lot of people have this question. This is the last week of class. You guys are getting ready to go out there and spread your wings. And a question I get asked a lot is where should I start working? Where, you know, what, what place would be best for me? And the answer is it really depends. Um, some of you will do fantastic in the hospital. Others of you will not. And if you pick wrong when you're very first out of school, your very first healthcare job, if you get this wrong, if you get into the wrong place for your personality, chances are you're going to fail spectacularly. And that will most likely push you out of healthcare completely because it'll affect your, your confidence. And I don't want that to happen. A lot of times it's not what you're doing, it's where you're doing it and what their expectations are. So I want you to have good expectations before you go out to find a job and figuring out where you belong is a big part of that. Not all healthcare is created equal. A lot of people want to um, jump right into the hospital. I, I don't know why. Everybody thinks it's Grey's Anatomy. Dr. McDreamy does not work there, I promise. Okay. Um, hospitals are fast paced. A lot going on. Admissions, discharges. These patients are very ill, so they change very quickly. You've got to have great communication with your nurses to be able to report everything off to them. Um, it's a very fast paced environment. If you are a person that does not do well with change, this is not the place for you. And a lot of people fail to realize that. Um, hospitals uh, generally don't pay as much either. A lot of people get confused about that. Hospitals do not pay as much. Pay is going to be based not just on the type of work that you do, but more importantly, on the place that you do it and how hard it is for them to get staff. If you are working at a place that everybody wants to work at, well, they don't have to pay as much to get qualified help. If you are working at a place that nobody wants to work at, they're going to have to pay you more to get you there. Make sense? Okay. So usually the higher rates of pay are going to be found in nursing homes. So if you're concerned about pay, nursing home might be a better option for you. Does that make sense? Okay. So you have to think about demand when it comes to um, pay skills. Let me turn the air on. And this quiz is free. Oh, I don't have my mic on. Sorry, guys. Mm 
All right. So let's start today's lesson with bedpan. This is on page 147 of your book. Oh. Okay, so let me go through some of these um, questions because my um, assistant is off this morning. So let's see here. I am Amber says, hi, Miss Patty. I passed my state exam last week. I missed only four questions thanks to you. Congratulations, Amber. Uh, Woodley is waiting for the t uh, my test this week. So good vibes out to you. You're going to do fantastic. And let's see here. Okay, Crazy Banana, I got your um, scores here. Somebody asked, did they give the results the same day? Yes, in Florida, you get your results the same day. And... To be honest, it wasn't bad at all. If you follow Miss Patty and do the practice test also, you should be okay. All right. Okay. Hold on one second. I got to get my puppy cam up. He's a week old. And oh my gosh, I'm in love. Good morning. Oops, let me take that down here. Okay. I'm sorry guys, I'm playing both both roles right now. All right, so in your book, page 147, we're gonna talk about bedpan. Not much to learn here. We already know all the principles. We know to follow the care plan, do our opening, evaluate if we need gloves. You do, because you're touching body fluids. We're gonna use a barrier, but we're gonna use a barrier a little differently for this one. We'll talk about that. Of course, scoot and roll is gonna play into this because the patient always needs to be in the middle of the bed. We're gonna clean the bedpan the way we clean everything else, and we'll do the closing. I have a video on this. Somebody with your level of experience should be able to do this in 10 minutes or less. And it's going to be done on another testing student. That means one of you guys might be a patient for this. But before you panic, let me explain how. You are going to remain fully clothed. You are not actually going to pee in the bedpan. Okay, you're going to remain fully clothed. They're going to put a hospital gown on over your clothing and this is gonna be a simulation event. So they're still gonna put a bedpan under your bottom. They're still gonna take it out, but that you're not actually going to go in the bedpan and nobody's gonna to try to clean you up, okay? So it's a simulation skill. So let's take a look at the care plan at the top of page 148. This care plan says the resident has requested a bedpan the resident is not wearing undergarments and is able to wipe self. The resident is able to move as directed. Now, the reason that it says this is because for the test, they don't want anyone trying to pull your pants down. Okay. They also don't want anyone in your no-no area trying to clean you up for the test. Understand that in a clinical setting, if the patient needs help removing their undergarments, we're going to help them. If they need help getting cleaned up after a bedpan, we're going to help them, but not this patient. Make sense? Remember, the care plans are always, always um, prepared for that patient. They're individualized. Oops. Well, let's talk a little bit about bedpans.
All right. So our care plan here tells us the resident is able to move as directed. So we can actually ask this patient, can you lift your hips up? They, we can ask that. Um, and for the test, they're going to be able to because you guys can all lift your hips. In a clinical setting, if the patient can't lift their hips, then we would roll them to the side, put the bedpan underneath them, and roll them back onto their back. So we're going to handle this two different ways, depending on what our patient's level of ability is. But thankfully, this patient for the test, our care plan says they can move as directed. So just ask them to lift. It makes it a little bit easier. Okay. Let's talk about toileting methods. I need you to understand that bedpan is a last resort. Last resort. If we have no other way, then we'll consider a bedpan. But as a, a nurse, the doctor actually is the one that writes orders here. Okay. So as a nurse, I can influence that order, but I can't override that order. So when a patient gets admitted to the hospital, they come with doctor's orders. And one of the, the ways, um, one of the things that's going to be on that order is toileting. So in most cases, your patient's going to have bathroom privileges. This means the patient can go to the bathroom anytime they want to and take care of everything on their own. You all have bathroom privileges. You just go when you need to go. Don't need any help while you're there. Don't need to tell anybody when you're done right? You're independent. So we call that bathroom privileges. And whenever possible, we're going to allow our patient to maintain that. But um, some patients aren't going to be able to do that all on their own. They're going to need a little help. That would be bathroom with assist. So bathroom privileges is what we want. If they need some help, bathroom with assist. If they can't make it all the way to the bathroom. We have portable toilets called bedside commodes that we can bring right up next to the bed and, and the patient can transfer from the bed to the portable toilet. It still gives a toilet-like experience. And as CNAs, we're going to clean the bedside commode and keep it in usable condition for them. But it gives them kind of a toilet-like experience without having to get all the way to the bathroom. That can be with or without assist. Now, if they can't get to the bathroom and they can't use a bedside commode for whatever reason, now we have to make some hard decisions and we got to look a little bit deeper. So the first thing I'm going to ask myself is, is this patient even continent? If they're incontinent, then we're just going to do peri care every two hours. We've got a process for that. We learned that last week. If they're continent, and they can't get to the bathroom and they can't get to a bedside commode. I only have two options left, a catheter or a bedpan. Do you guys notice how I had to get through all of that to get down to bedpan? Bedpan is last. There's a lot of reasons bedpan is last. But we need to understand it's last. Now, the doctor writes that order. As a nurse, I can influence it. I can call the doctor up and say, hey, we've got this patient on bedpan, but they're weight bearing now. Can I get an order for bedside mode or bathroom? Um, I can influence it, but the order comes from the doctor. Can CNAs change this? No. This is super important. And you may have a test question on this for the state exam that, you know, your patient has an order for bedpan. However, they ask if they can go to the bathroom, what is your appropriate response? So you need to understand that you can't change this. You can't go get a bedside commode as an um, uh, alternative. You can't help them to the bathroom. You're going to notify the nurse of the patient's request. Make sense? Okay. So let me explain to you why bedpan is last on the list. First of all, they're not easy to use. They're not overly comfortable. But the real problem here is psychological. You've been trained since you were about this tall. Don't pee in the bed. 
don't pee in the bed. Don't pee in the bed and certainly don't poop in the bed. Just because I put a plastic pan under your bottom does not mean that your brain is going to let you go. So when we're using bed pants with patients, it often takes two or three or four attempts before they get any results. We put a bed pan under them and we leave and we wait. Ten minutes later, they're not able to go. So we're going to take the bed pan out and try again in a little while. So we need to understand this is a psychological restriction. It's also physiological as well. It's hard to go in the bed. You're not in the right position. Think about the position you're in on the toilet. The bed is not the same position. It's also uncomfortable for patients um, psychologically because anything that they're doing in the bed, they know their roommate can hear it or smell it. And that can be a restrictive um, event as well. People are afraid to go because they don't want other people to hear them going. Have you ever been in a public bathroom and it was a little bit awkward because it was quiet, right? Same thing. It can affect your ability to go. Does that make sense? So bedpans are not ideal. They're last on the list. If we can figure out any other way to get this patient's needs met, we will. But if we have to, we have to learn how to use them properly, okay? So we know this one, clean rolls toward me, dirty rolls away. And this is how we're going to put the chucks underneath the bedpan. Now, the reason that we're putting a chucks underneath the bedpan is because if it spills, you don't want that on the sheet. So we're going to put a chucks under the patient and then the bedpan on top of the chucks. And then we're going to... Um, when we put the bedpan under the chucks, we're going to make sure it's positioned properly. So the wider end of the bedpan, the part that looks like a toilet seat, goes under the bottom. So, you know, like a toilet seat. Imagine trying to sit on this. Ooh, that would not be comfortable. So we want the wider end under the bot patient's bottom. And after we put the bedpan in place, we have to elevate the head of the bed. Now, the reason for that is because if this is my bedpan and this is my patient, if we put a bedpan underneath the patient's bottom, what does it do to their middle? Yeah, it raises it up. How many of you ladies can pee uphill? And having a bowel movement uphill is next to impossible. So when you put a bedpan under a patient, you can't just leave them in that position. We have to get them in a normal elimination position. So putting the head of the bed up is the most important step for this skill. Because even if the patient is able to push it out, push that pee out in this position, they push really hard and the pee comes out, you know where it's going? Right up their back and into their hair. That's pretty high on my gross meter. Don't know about yours, but we have to make sure that the patient's head of the bed goes up. But we don't want to touch that. Those gloves have just been underneath the patient. We put a chucks under there. We put a bedpan under there. We have butt juice on our gloves. Do you want to touch that bed controller with butt juice gloves? Okay, so we're going to take those gloves off before we put the head of the bed up. Once we put the head of the bed up, we're leaving them to be able to go. We want them to have some privacy. Privacy is essential here. So we're going to give them a call light to let us know when they're done and some toilet paper because our care plan said they could wipe themselves. So we're going to give them those items and we're going to step away. Now for the test, you have nowhere to go. There's no other patient. This is your only patient. There's no other room to go to. You've only got one testing room. You are stuck there. You're going to be on the other side of the curtain waiting. So you, you're not leaving the patient's environment. So you don't have to go wash your hands. In a clinical setting, don't stick around. Patients can't go with an audience. You're going to wash your hands, leave the room, go take care of somebody else, come back when the call light goes off. Okay? Once for the test, they say they're done. We're going to come back in, lower the head of the bed. And then remove the bedpan and the chucks together because we can't carry an open container of urine through.
through a room. That is a principle. We cannot carry an open container of urine through a room. So we have to cover it. We're going to use that chucks to cover it. Okay. We're going to clean it the same way we clean everything else. We'll dump the um, contents in the toilet, rinse the bedpan, dump that into the toilet, and then we'll give our patient a hand wipe because we know where their hands have just been. After we do all that, we can remove that privacy blanket and pull the sheet back up and um, in our skill. Now, there's something for bedpan that I want you to be aware of, and this is called a bedpan cleaner. A lot of people don't know this. This is taken from a hospital, uh, this picture. So you'll have these in hospitals, sometimes rehabs, some nursing homes, but not many. It looks like a little shower head. When you pivot this forward. So it, it actually kind of pivots. So it's um, perpendicular to the toilet bowl. When it, when you bring that forward, it starts to spray into the toilet bowl. This is a bedpan cleaner. It allows you to clean the bedpan right over the toilet bowl and dump the contents in. But the problem is that this is under pressure, that water's under pressure. When you have water under pressure hitting a flat plastic surface, you're going to get splashback. So if you're going to use a bedpan cleaner like this, you need to dress for the job. We don't want any of that human waste on our face. So we want to put a mask and shield on to protect all of our open doorways. We also want to cover our clothing with one of those yellow isolation gowns to prevent any um, biological waste from getting on our clothing as well. So if you're gonna use a bedpan cleaner, you need to have a gown and face protection on. By the way, masks do not help with odor. They're not designed to help with odor. They don't filter out odor. So it's not really gonna help with that aspect. If you're odor sensitive, you can go get some Vicks, you know the stuff mom used to rub on your chest, right, the mentholated Vicks and just put a little dab under your nose. It does help cut uh, smell. Now, I can't use Vicks. I've got super, super sensitive skin. You put Vicks on my nose, I'm going to look like Rudolph in like two seconds. I'll get all red, blotchy. So I use Vaseline with a couple of drops of essential oils. Lemongrass is my favorite. Orange blossom is good too. But you want a stronger scent that you like. And just mix that together and then you can put a little dab underneath your nose and it helps filter some of that odor out. Okay, good. Well, let's talk about that whole splashback thing because we're not the only ones it affects here. When your patient is on a bedpan, okay, so we have a bedpan under our patient. That bedpan is only about this deep. It's not very deep at all. So when pee comes out, it's under pressure. So we have P under pressure hitting a flat plastic surface about this far from the undercarriage. You're going to get splashback. This is going to be a messy event for the patient. Now, thankfully, our care plan says they can clean themselves up. Yay. But in a clinical setting, they're probably going to need a little help here because of splashback. But there is something you can do. But you have to ask the nurse. Okay, this has to have permission. If our patient isn't on intake and output, remember we talked about intake and output where we measure everything that goes in and everything that comes out, right? Well, urine comes out. So if they're on intake and output, we have to measure the urine. If they're not on intake and output, get some toilet paper, make big loops of toilet paper, five or six big loops of toilet paper, lay it down on the bottom of the bedpan and it absorbs the urine, prevents splashback, makes it so much nicer. Excuse me. Excuse me. Much more comfortable for your patient. Good? Make sense? So big loops of toilet paper will help prevent that splashback. It also prevents the urine from sloshing with the head of the bed going up and down. So we like toilet paper in the bottom of the bed pan, but we can't use it if we're measuring the output. Good? Now, same thing with uh, the next tip I'm going to give you. Have you ever sat on a like leather car seats and shorts? What happens to your skin? 
sticks. Yeah, it sticks. And you have to peel yourself off, right? Well, bedpans are plastic. Our bodies are 98.6 degrees. That's hot, guys. It's hot. So when you have a 98.6 degree butt on a plastic bedpan for any amount of time, that bedpan is going to stick. So it's going to be kind of hard to get it out from under them, right? So again, you have to ask the nurse, but if you put a little bit of powder or cornstarch on the seat part of the bedpan, it slides under the patient really easily. More importantly, it slides out even better. Okay, but we can't use that if our patient has respiratory problem or an incision because you don't want that powder or cornstarch in the incision or a wound or something like that. So we need to check with the nurse. Can I put toilet paper in? and cornstarch on. If the answer is yes to both of those, yay, this becomes way easier. For the test, we're not going to have that problem. Remember, your patient remains fully clothed. So you just slide the bedpan in, slide it back out. Good? All right. So remember, the wider end of the bedpan goes under the widest end of the patient. All right. So let me show you this skill. That's all we have to learn. Let me show you this skill. I'm going to show you the video because it has really good close-ups. We should have about roughly two hours of practice time today at the end of class. So what I have to show you does not take a whole lot of time this morning. <laughs> so we should have some uh, time built in for practice. For quite a bit of time building. Jones, my name is Patty. I'm your CNA today. How are you? Good. How are you? Wonderful. I understand you need a bedpan. Can I assist you with that? Sure. I'm going to close your curtain, wash my hands, get my supplies, and I'll be right back. Okay, I'll need a chuck and a privacy blanket for this skill. Okay, Mr. Jones, I'm going to place this privacy blanket over you. This will help keep you warm and protect your privacy as we do this skill. Is that okay? Yes. Okay. I'm going to spread this out without snapping it or shaking it. And I'll have you hold this in place so I can pull your sheet down. That way your sheet remains clean as we do this skill. Okay, I'm going to prepare a chucks to place under you before we put the bed pan in place. I'm going to hold the chucks up lengthwise and roll it toward me. Clean rolls toward me, dirty rolls away. And I'll just place this on the bed. I'm going to open the drawer that the bed pan is in and get a set of gloves. Okay, Mr. Jones, in just a moment, I'm going to ask you to bend your knees, lift your hips as high off the bed as you can, and I'm going to unroll the chucks underneath you. Okay? Okay. All right, go ahead and bend your knees and lift up. Okay, and you can relax. I'm going to go around to the other side of the bed and unroll it. Okay, Mr. Jones, can you lift up again, please? I'll smooth the chucks out, making sure it's positioned properly on the bed. You can relax. Okay, now I'll get the bed pan out from in the drawer. And I'm going to place this under your bottom if I can get you to lift and relax. Is that comfortable? Yes. Okay, I'm going to put the head of the bed up, but let me remove my gloves first. Okay. Okay, I'm going to put the head of the bed up. Please tell me when you're comfortable. Okay. And you may have to adjust that bed pan a little bit as it moves. 
Tell me when you're comfortable. That's good. Okay. Here's your toilet paper and your call light. And I'm just going to wait out here. Please let me know when you're done. Okay, Mr. Jones, I understand you're finished. Let me help you with that. I'm going to put the head of the bed down now. And please do not lift your hips. Once the head of the bed is in the lowered position, I'll put on a pair of gloves. And I'm going to hold that bed pan flat as you lift off of it. Okay, Mr. Jones, I'm going to take a corner of the chucks and hold the bed pan flat as you lift off of it. You can go ahead and lift on the count of three. One, two, three. Thank you. I'll remove both the bed pan and the chucks and take them to the bathroom for disposal. I'll be right back. Once I get over here to the bathroom, I'm going to unwrap the bed pan and we'll throw the chucks away. I'm going to empty the contents of the bed pan into the toilet and then I'll rinse the bed pan. We'll deposit the rinse water into the toilet as well. and then we'll set the bed pan down to dry. I'll pick it up with a paper towel. I'm gonna to dry the inside. We'll throw that paper towel away. I'll dry the outside, throw that paper towel away, and get one for the drawer. Okay, I'm gonna place the bed pan in the drawer along with the toilet paper. We'll use the paper towel to close the drawer. Now I can remove my gloves. Mr. Jones, would you like to wipe your hands? Thank you. Okay, you can relax your legs if you'd like. And I'm going to pull your sheet up and remove the privacy blanket. We want to make sure that we roll the blanket in a ball so that any trailing edges don't contaminate other surfaces. There you go. Here's your call light. I'm going to go put this in dirty linen. I'll be right back. Okay, Mr. Jones, are you comfortable? Is yes. there anything else I can get for you while I'm here? No. A magazine, perhaps? You. Your call light is there. Please let me know if there's anything that we can do. I'm going to open your curtain and go wash my hands. Thank you. After washing my hands, I'll review the steps of my skill, make any corrections, and then tell the evaluator my skill is done. All right, any questions on that? Um, so for this skill, we're allowed to um, close the curtain, wash our hands, and then just get the supplies out of the drawer, or do we need a barrier to like lay all over our system? Okay, so or does it really matter? doesn't matter. Okay. You can get a barrier and put it on the table. Not a problem. And put all of your supplies on the barrier like we do for every other skill. You can do that. I don't. And the reason I don't is that this is where my patient eats. Mm -hmm. And I personally don't like toileting items on an eating surface. Even with a barrier, it kind of grosses me out. So I don't use the table for supplies for this skill even though there's a barrier. Now you can, there's no law against it. As long as you're using a barrier, you can. But in the video, you saw it without a barrier. You just leave everything in the drawer until you're ready to use it and you pull it out as you need it. And to me, that's a little bit better way of handling it, but for consistency's sake, if you want to put a barrier on the table and put everything on the barrier like we do for every other skill, you are allowed. Okay? I don't like that. So for the test, though, it doesn't matter? Doesn't matter. Okay. Doesn't matter. As long as you use a barrier. Okay. Don't set the bedpan directly on the table. That will affect <laughs> you. All right. So let's move on to catheter care. This is on page 158. If the like if the patient like swallows themselves and then we have to clean them up, do we have to wait until the nurse tells us to do it or can we just do it? No, that that's something you're going to clean the patient as needed. Okay. 
yet as needed. All right, so catheter care, again, there's not much to teach you here. Almost every principle is used, though. So this is a big skill. It's a washing skill. Um, we're going to follow the care plan, do our opening. We need some gloves. We'll use a barrier. Cover the patient with a privacy blanket. Linen rules apply. Always make sure the patient's in the middle of the bed. Whatever we wash, we rinse. Whatever we rinse, we dry. We'll use the leaves method. We're going to clean the basin the same way we clean everything else. And we're going to do our closing. So we know how to do this skill already. What I'm going to show you are the fine points of how to do the skill. Um, somebody with your level of experience should be able to do this in 15 minutes or less. And this is going to be done on a mannequin for the test. So if we look at the top of page 159 up here, you can see the care plan. And our care plan tells us to provide catheter care with soap and water to a female resident with an indwelling urinary catheter. Remember, this is a mannequin skill. Clean the catheter tubing and perineal area only. So it's telling us exactly what we're supposed to clean here, the catheter tubing and the peri area, okay? Step-by-step -step instructions tell you exactly how to do this. Our supplies are listed down here. And if you're having trouble learning the supplies, the flashcards are really going to help because the flashcards have supplies for every single um, skill that we learn, okay? So if you're having trouble remembering your supplies, remember, for the test, it's not going to tell you what you need. You have to know. So you have to learn these. So the flashcards will help you if you're having trouble there. Do you guys remember peri care? You guys remember peri care? We clean down the middle, one side, the other side, skin fold, skin fold, we rinse, we dry, right? But with peri care, we also turn the patient over and clean the back side because it been laying on that wet pad. Well, catheter care is very similar. The big difference is we don't have to clean the back side because they're not laying on a wet pad. The tube is collecting the urine. And um, we're going to clean the tubing instead of the back side. So that's the big difference this year. We're still going to put our checks underneath. We're still going to clean the peri area the same way. We're going to clean the tubing. We're not going to clean the back side and we're not going to leave them on any checks at the end. So that's what makes it a little bit different. So catheter care usually is done once a shift. Now your care plan may say differently. Your policy and procedures may say differently, but in general, it's gonna be done once per shift. And we're gonna clean the catheter as well as the skin around it. But while we're there, we also need to take a look at the bag and the tubing and make sure there's no problems there. The bag should never be near the floor the tubing should never be coiled near the floor either. We're going to get into that in just a few minutes. Also look to make sure it's not kinked. So let's talk about the catheter. A lot of um, students aren't familiar with catheters and they find it a little bit intimidating and a little bit scary. So I want to remove some of that fear from you by showing you how all this works. Okay. This is a catheter. It's what you see here. At the end of the catheter is a little balloon. This does not appear to have a balloon. It actually does. I'm going to show you in just a second. But the balloon is actually integrated into the catheter. When we put the catheter in, the balloon is not inflated. It goes in like this. Once we get it in place in the bladder, then we inflate the balloon with some water. And that's going to hold it in place. So we have the catheter tip, which has holes that allows the urine to drain out. We have a balloon that holds it in place. We have the catheter itself, the catheter tubing, which just directs the urine out. And then down here, we've got a couple of ports. That's what you see here. 
One port is going to connect to some sort of a bag. The other port, this one, is what we would use to inflate and deflate the balloon. It's kind of like a tube in a tube type thing. Now, this is where the two connect. That's going to be important in just a minute. Then you've got the bag tubing. You've got the bag itself. You have some markings on the bag, which we do not use to measure urine. We have the port, which is how we empty the bag. And then we have the little house that the port lives in. So these are all of the parts of this system. Okay, good. All right, remember that they're two separate pieces. So the catheter and the bag are two separate pieces. We're going to join them together. Just like this. Now it's one piece, but they come as two separate pieces. The reason is this bag needs to be changed out about once a week, but the catheter can stay in for up to a month. So since the drainage bag is usually changed more frequently, once a week, we have to have two separate pieces. So let's talk about you and what you do. So CNAs are responsible for cleaning the catheter, the skin around the catheter, emptying the drainage bag, and documenting output. That's what we do. We clean the tubing, the skin around the tubing, empty the bag, and document. We do not change catheters or bags. We do not put catheters in or take them out. We do not change out the bag. We don't do anything other than clean the skin and the catheter, empty the bag, and document the output. That is our job here. Now, you can be trained to do some of those other tasks if your setting requires it. But generally speaking, for the test, this is all we do. Okay? CNAs do not put catheters in. Our biggest problem here with catheters is this. Remember we talked about this on week one? You guys remember this? This is our biggest problem because bladders are the ideal breeding environment for your patient or for uh, bacteria, the ideal breeding environment. It's warm, it's dark, it's moist, it's got an all-you-can-eat buffet and an open bar. Remember I said the bacteria don't need little boy bacteria, little girl bacteria to have baby bacteria. It doesn't work that way. Bacteria need the right conditions and the right food sources, and they zip themselves in half, and now we have two. You guys remember that? Well, when we allow bacteria to get into the bladder, everything they need is right there to be able to zip themselves in half and become two. So we want to prevent that from happening. If it does happen, we actually give it its own name. It's called a CAUTI, C-A-U-T-I, Catheter Acquired Urinary Tract Infection. And these are super dangerous. They kill about 2,500 people a year. Let me explain why and why it's so important that we get this right. So this is a normal urinary system. We went over this last week. We have two kidneys. Those kidneys filter blood, produce urine 24 hours a day. Those urine drips, drip, drip, drip down tubes called ureters. They collect in the bladder. A valve at the bottom of the bladder holds them in until we go to the bathroom. Then we, the urine comes out through the urethra into the toilet. The valve closes and we're ready to go again. You guys remember all that? Remember that? All right. So when we have a catheter, that whole system is still the same. Kidneys still filter blood, produce urine. That urine still drips, drips, drips down ureters into the bladder. What changes here is we have a catheter 
that the nurse has inserted, and remember the hole is already there. We're not drilling anything. The hole is already there. So we insert the catheter through the urethra up into the bladder. Once it's in the bladder, we know it's in the bladder because urine comes through those holes and out. So we know we're in the bladder. And then once, once we have it in the bladder, we would inject some water to fill up that balloon. And now that that balloon is full, it's going to sit right there on top of the valve. So all that balloon does is keep the bladder, keep the catheter in the bladder. That's all it does. You can't feel that balloon. Look how big that, that bladder is. You can't feel that balloon. What you can feel is the catheter on the inside of the urethra because it's got to fit snug. If it doesn't, that's way too much. See how there's lots of space around that catheter? Urine is going to leak out of that. So if our catheter isn't snug in that area, we're going to get some leakage. Does that make sense? Right? So that means that because it's got to be snug in there, the urethra is not used to that. It causes some irritation. Over time, the body does get used to it. Now, when we're getting ready to take the catheter out, we don't pull it. Oh, that bubble coming through that urethra, that's going to tear tissue and hurt. So what do you think we could do to let this slide out easily? Yeah. We just take our, oops. We just take our water out. I need another hand. And then it just slides right out, just like that. <laughs> Okay, make sense? Now, sometimes, sometimes these come out when we don't mean them to, when we don't anticipate them to. And if they come out before we take the water out of the balloon, it can cause a little bit of problems. Oh, hi, Caitlin. Esther says, at what position does the patient wipe himself? And does he keep holding the soil tissue until the CNA gets back? Oh, that's a great question, Esther. And this has to do with the previous skill, bed pan. So every situation is going to be a little bit different. In most cases, people will wipe themselves sitting up if they can, if they can reach. Um, and then they can drop the, the um, used tissue in the bed pan itself. No problem. You can also make sure there's a trash can nearby. That's another option. Sometimes your patients can't get up and under to clean effectively when they're on a bedpan. So in that case, we would clean them after we take the bedpan off. Just turn them on their side and help them get cleaned up. Okay, every situation is going to be a little bit different, handled by whatever the patient needs at that time. Okay, so when we have a catheter holding that valve open, that means whatever urine is in that bladder is just going to come right out. There's nothing to keep it in the bladder anymore. It's going to come out through the tube. So now we have to connect that tube, that catheter, to something to hold the urine. And that something is going to be a bag. Now, there's a couple of different types of bags. This is a bedside bag, which is what you see here. And this is something we use in clinical settings quite often. It's going to hold a lot of urine, pretty big bag. Um, and this is what we call a bedside drainage bag because it kind of hangs on the bed, okay, side of the bed. But if the patient is out and about, if they're at Winn-Dixie or Walmart or Bush Gardens or wherever they are, if they are out and about, then Nobody wants to carry a suitcase of urine with them. That's a little embarrassing, right? People will stare. So we need something that's a little more discreet. And that's where a leg bag comes in. Leg bags are going to hold a little bit less urine, but they're going to um, secure to the inside of the thigh or the calf with some elastic bands. And it's just going to hold the urine as it comes out of the body. The patient goes to the bathroom like anybody else. And instead of going to the bathroom, they empty the bag. Okay. Make sense? 
Sincerely says, do we get tested on a real person for the bedpan skill? Yes. Sincerely, yes. It will be a real person, but they're not actually going to pee in the bedpan. That part's going to be simulated, but putting the bedpan under the patient or taking it out, that is a real person. Yes. All right, so both of these, the leg bag and the bedside bag, they both have the same port like this same port. It's going to go into the port of the catheter, just like this. So all of these attach the same way. So the same port goes into the catheter, whether it's a leg bag or a bedside bag. They both attach the same way. Okay. Remember, that's not something that CNAs do, but it's something you need to know. So the way a leg bag works is it's way more discreet. You have the catheter inside the bladder coming out. It's going to attach to the leg bag. And the leg bag itself is going to be on the inside of the thigh, or you can do it on the inside of the calf, depending on the size of the patient, um, with elastic straps to hold it in place. It's way more discreet. You would be surprised at how many people are walking around with this. You would be surprised. There are a lot of patients, um, particularly male patients, that have uh, catheters. Um, and it's, it was pretty common back when we did prostate, early prostate surgery, um, it, they would often inadvertently cut the nerves that control the bladder during prostate. So those patients would have to have a catheter. And they manage it themselves. But you'd be surprised at how common that actually is. So the problem is that as CNAs, remember, we clean the skin and the catheter. We empty the bag and document our readings, right? Those are our four tasks with catheters. Well, the problem is that when we empty the bag, remember I said that we don't change this bag unless we've been trained, right? Well, if we change that bag, when we take this out and put another one in, we could introduce bacteria in there. And that's really close to the bladder. That's a bad thing. That's why you're not allowed to do that without additional training. But if we go way down here, this is where we empty the bag, this drainage port. If we allow bacteria into the system when we're emptying it, that bacteria is now in urine, all the food source it needs. So it starts to multiply and it starts to run out of room. So it climbs as it climbs, it multiplies more and more and more and more. And by the time it gets up here, there's lots and lots of bacteria. And now we're blocking out light, fresh food. So we've got trillions of bacteria that are marching up, and when they jump out of this hole into the bladder, it's not just one or two bacteria. We're talking about one or two trillion bacteria that can easily overwhelm the patient's defenses. This is why catheter-associated or catheter-acquired urinary tract infections kill 2,500 people a year because the infection is sudden, overwhelming, and unable to be overcome. You guys see how that could be a problem? We have to be super careful when we're working with catheters not to allow any bacteria into the system anywhere. So there's three places that bacteria can get into the system. Right here, where, where it's inserted, we don't put catheters in, so this isn't our problem. Right here, where the catheter and bag meet, but we don't change the bag, so this isn't our problem. And then down here, where the emptying port is, this is our problem. So when we're emptying the bag, we have to pay super close attention to what we're doing here. Infection control is going to be graded really, really strongly with this skill. Bedside drainage bags, 
should be on a non-moving part of the bed. That makes sense. You don't want to pull the catheter out. And it should also hang above the floor. You don't want that bag to touch the floor. Remember, the floors aren't clean. And we don't want any bacteria to get on and then potentially in the bag. So the bag has to be hanging from a non-moving part of the bed above the floor. And we have to make sure that the tubing isn't kinked. The other thing that we want to look at with the tubing is to make sure that it's not coiled near the floor. We're going to get to that in the next slide. Don't lift the uh, bag above the level of the patient's hips because, ew. This would let all the urine that's in that tubing run back into the patient. I don't know about you, but urine really should be a one-way trip. I don't want recycled urine. And I'm sure your patient doesn't want recycled urine. So never lift the bag above the level of the patient's hips. Anybody ever watch Discovery shows, you know, like My 600 Pound Life and those, mm -hmm. those types of things? It's so funny because I'll watch those shows and toward the end, if the surgery was successful, they'll walk the patient down the hall and they always have a urine bag. And usually somebody's carrying it like up here. Yeah. Ew. Don't do that. Don't do because I'll make fun of you. <laughs> Don't do that. All that's doing is allowing that urine to run right up into the patient. And that's really gross. Sometimes patients will pull their catheters out, especially if they're confused, very common. Remember, it's an irritant. It's getting very snug. It doesn't belong there. And it irritates patients, so they tend to pull on it. Catheters shouldn't cause pain, but they probably are going to be irritating for a while until the body gets used to it. If your patient starts pulling on a catheter, you need to let the nurse know right away, because chances are they're going to pull it out. And we don't want that. Um, if the tubing is coiled near the floor, we could end up pulling it out. Your feet can get all tangled up in that tubing, and it's very easy to end up pulling that catheter out of the patient. So we want to make sure that the tubing isn't coiled near the floor. It should always be coiled on the bed. Believe it or not, patients do pull catheters out quite often, but we pull them out way more. We do. CNAs pull way more catheters out than patients do. Transferring a patient out of bed and into a wheelchair. If you aren't aware of where that catheter is, you'll pull it out. Walking a patient. If you forgot to grab the bag before you left, you'll pull it out. Um, leaning up against the bed when you're turning a patient over. If you trap that tubing between your leg and the bed, you'll pull it out. There are a million ways for CNAs to pull catheters out. So if your patient has a catheter, you need to be aware of it and monitor it at all times and treat it as if it's a part of the patient. Okay, this happens way more often than you would think. And it's painful for the patient. Imagine you've got a bubble this big coming through an opening this big. You're gonna get tissue tearing. You're gonna get some blood. And anytime we have injury, we always have swelling. This is probably not a place we want swelling. And if the patient can pee out of it, what is that going to feel like? Razor blades. So if a patient pulls a catheter out, you need to let the nurse know right away. Right away. This isn't a wait until after break situation. Right away. Because as a nurse, I only have... My microphone. As a nurse, I only have about 45 minutes to make a decision. If I need to put another catheter in, I've got to do it quick. Because if I don't get that catheter in before swelling sets in, I'm not going to be able to get the catheter in. So this is one of those things that you don't want to delay. If a catheter comes out, you need to let the nurse know right away. Don't delay. Does that make sense? If a catheter comes out, don't throw it away. Don't put it in the, the soiled utility room. You need to put it in a, its own bag. So in the bottom of trash cans, I don't know if you guys know this, in clinical settings, 
in the bottom of trash cans are always three or four empty trash bags, just in the bottom of the trash can. So you take the current bag out, grab a new one, put the current bag back in and use that new bag to put the catheter and the bag in. And the reason for that is this. This is an intact catheter. If this comes out, I can deal with that. that that's a nurse problem. If the um, bubble burst, I'm going to pass this around so you can see it. If the bubble burst, this is not a nurse problem. This is a doctor problem because that means a piece of it probably stayed behind. And now the doctor has to go fishing. And I'm not kidding. We actually put a camera in there with little grabbers and they go looking for the piece in the bladder. If we leave it, the patient can actually have very serious problems. So the only way for me to know if the catheter comes out, if it's a nurse problem or a doctor problem, is to look at it. Does that make sense? So I'll pass these two around so you guys can see. So there's three different types of catheters that you need to be aware of. This one that I'm passing around, this is an indwelling catheter, what we call a Foley catheter. Because remember, in healthcare, one name isn't enough. We always have to have two. So this is an indwelling or a Foley catheter. There's another type of catheter called a Red Robinson or a straight cath, and that's this guy. This is a straight cath. Notice down here, it doesn't have that extra little port. That's because this doesn't stay in. We put it in, we drain the bladder, we take it out. Nurses use this. When it goes in, they have to hold it in place because this is like spaghetti. I let this out and it's just going to fall right out if I let go of it. This is a straight cath. So an indwelling catheter has a balloon on the end. A straight cath does not. So straight caths are simply um, for one-time use to empty the bladder. And then you've got the bottom one. This is called, this one actually has three names. This is called a Texas catheter, a condom catheter, or an external catheter. It looks like a condom, goes on like a condom. Has a little tip at the end, and that's what the, ba the bag attaches to. Um, this is less invasive. It just collects the urine as it comes out, so there's less infection risk here. Um, but the problem is that it allows the urine to stay on the tip. This is only for men. It allows the urine to stay up against the tip of the penis, which can... Um, eat at that skin. So really good skincare is important here if we're using a um, Texas catheter or a condom catheter. So when we do catheter care, it's just like what we did with peri care. We're going to hold that catheter up out of the way and clean using the leaves method. So I'm going to squirt five uh, leaves. So one, two, three, four, and five. And then I'm gonna hold that catheter out of the way and go once down the middle, fold that over, down one side, fold that over, down the other side, fold that over, down the skin fold, fold that over, down the skin fold. Whatever we wash, we rinse, rinse the same way. And then we're gonna pat dry from top to bottom. Once we get to the bottom, move away. Don't go back up. And then we're going to clean the catheter itself. Remember, we're always moving away from the urethra. When we clean the catheter, we want to hold it where it exits the body and clean, wiping away from the body. Thank you. Clean, wiping away from the body. But make sure you hold it. Even though it's got a balloon on the end, we don't want to tug on it while we're cleaning it. So make sure that we're holding it. Okay. And we're going to follow the care plan. Care plan tells us to provide catheter care with soap and water to a female resident with an indwelling urinary catheter. 
clean the catheter tubing and the perineal area only. So here are our steps for catheter care. Okay. We're going to do our opening. We're going to get our, wash our hands, put our uh, barrier out, get our supplies. Then we'll get our water. We're going to check the water. Who else checks it? Patient. We're going to use a privacy blanket because the patient will be uncovered. We're going to put our gloves on. First thing your glove should touch is the patient. We'll turn the patient onto their side and we're going to put a chucks underneath them because as we're cleaning, we don't want that bed to get wet. Once we get the chucks in place, we're going to roll the gown up inside the blanket, just like we did for Pericare. And we're going to um, cover the legs with a towel to minimize exposure. We'll wring those washcloths out. Remember, no drippy wet washcloths. We're going to use five leaves. We'll apply soap to all five leaves. We're going to hold the catheter and clean in five strokes downward away from the urethra. Whatever we wash, we rinse. Whatever we rinse, we dry. And then we're going to wring out washcloth number three. We're going to soak four leaves this time. We'll hold the catheter and clean away from the urethra with all four leaves. Whatever we wash, we rinse. rinse. Whatever we rinse, we dry. dry. And then we'll unroll that gown and the blanket. Once we do that, we're going to uh, scoot the patient toward us. Get rid of that chucks, return the patient at the center of the bed, covered with a blanket, and we're going to get rid of all of our supplies. So all of our dirty uh, linens go in linens. We're going to clean our basin using basin cleaning, and then we can remove our gloves. We'll remove the blanket and pull the sheet up and do our closing. So the whole skill. Questions? Questions? Okay, so now I'm not going to show you this one right away. I'm going to, we're going to go over drainage bag first, and then I'm going to show you those two, one right after the other, okay? All right, so let's go to page 164. Not much to learn here. We already know to follow the care plan, do our opening, wear gloves if we're going to ex be exposed to body fluids. We're going to use a barrier. We're going to clean our basin the same way we clean everything else, and we're going to do the closing. So let's learn about what makes this skill specific, the checkpoints we need to know about. So our care plan, let's start there, tells us to empty the resident's urinary drainage bag into a graduate container. And measure and record the urinary output on the documentation form in MLs or CCs. This is a triangular graduate, because it has graduated markings, container. This is what we're going to use to measure the urine from the bag. Down here, you can see your supplies. Right here is our documentation form. It's going to have a place for intake and output. Please make sure you're documenting in the output section. Otherwise, you're telling the nurse that the patient drank urine. Now, I know you might ro roll your eyes and think, well, the nurse should know no one would drink urine. That is not necessarily the case, people. And remember, this is legal documentation. If you write it, that means it happened. All right, so we went over this a, a few minutes ago, but remember there's two different types of bags. There's bedside bags and leg bags. And when we're emptying these, remember they both will um, uh, plug into the port on the catheter. But when we're emptying these, they're empty just a little bit different. This port comes out of its little house, and we have to open it using a slide valve. This doesn't have a house. This is a twist valve, okay? So leg bags are twist valves. 
bedside bags have a little house to live in. So let me pass this around to you. So when we empty this, we're going to put the graduate container on a barrier on the floor underneath the bag. Remember that bag cannot touch the floor. But nothing should touch the port. So when you're emptying this bag, of course, this is going to be up on the bed because remember, we don't want it coiled near the floor. This is going to be up on the, bat, uh, on the bed. When we're emptying the urine out of this bag, this port right here is what we're going to use to empty the bag. So we have to pull it out of its house. This part of the port, we cannot touch. You cannot put your finger on it. You can't let your gloves touch it. It can't touch the bed, the cup, the chucks, the bag, nothing. To open this, you slide the valve to the side, and now it's open. So we would position this over the cup. You can tilt the bag a little bit so that the urine comes out. When you're done, you want to close that valve and then put it back into its house without letting it touch anything. Okay, you don't want to do this. This part has to remain completely germ free. The only way to do that is to not let it touch anything. Okay, good. If it accidentally touches, do we let the nurse know so she can change it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now we used to wipe this off with alcohol and some of the videos you'll see online still have us wiping that with alcohol. That is no longer recommended because alcohol actually dries this material out. This is a polymer. It dries this out, causes little micro cracks to form, which is the ideal warm, dark, moist place for bacteria to hide. So we don't use alcohol any longer. So I'll pass this around. Just remember that port cannot touch anything and it has to be closed when we are done with the skill. So when we're done emptying it, if you forget to close it, that's a um, wide open doorway for pathogens. So it has to, has to, has to be closed. So, um, Woodley says, did partial bed bath include perineal care or on or question mark? Okay, so you're going to, for partial bed bath, you're going to wash whatever the care plan tells you to. So for prometric exam, the care plan tells you to wash the face, neck, chest, arm, or uh, one arm and hand and back. So only wash what the care plan tells you to wash. Um, so that, that's the answer to that. All right, so to open this valve, it's called a T-valve. You would slide this sideways thing to the side and you'll actually be able to see right into the bag. Once you're done, you slide it the other way to close it. But don't touch the tip of the port with your gloves. Remember, we can't let that tip touch anything. Now, once we have urine in the cup, can you guys see this? Can you see this? Okay, so once we have urine in the cup, wherever that urine line is, we're going to round it to the nearest line. Doesn't matter whether it's up or down. We want to round to the nearest line. So I don't know if you guys can see real well. There is a uh, yellow urine in this cup. And you can see that it stops right about the 450 mark. So that's what we would document. 450. If it were between 450 and 475, I would just round to the nearest, whichever line it's closest to. Now, in healthcare, we always use cc's, not ounces. So even, excuse me, even though it's almost 16 ounces here, we're going to use the cc's. Okay. All right, so we're going to document that on the output section of the documentation form. 
And here we're going to indicate time. Question I get asked a lot is, do I have to use military time? For the test, no. You can use regular time, but you have to put a.m. or p.m. if you use regular time. If you use military time, you don't. You're going to document it as urine, how much urine, which in that example we just looked at, it was 450 cc's. You can just set it on the table. And then my initials. After we document, we have to wash our hands. We're going to follow the care plan. We're going to do our opening, place our barrier and our clean supplies on the floor. We're going to use gloves. We'll empty the urine into the graduate container. You can tilt the bag, but we won't let the, the port touch anything. We'll close that valve. Remember, don't touch that port. We'll return it to storage. Don't let that port touch anything. We're gonna wrap the chucks around the um, graduate container. Remember, we don't carry open containers of urine through the room. We're gonna set it on the lid of the toilet. We have to, when we're measuring, measure on a barrier, on a flat surface, and at eye level. That means you have to get down to read it. After that, we'll empty the contents into the toilet. We'll clean our cup the same way we clean everything else, put it back in the drawer, remove our gloves, and then do our closing. Don't forget to document. And after you document, you're going to wash your hands again. Okay, good. So I'm going to show you both of these videos, one right after the other. My name is Patty. I'm your CNA today. How are you? Good. I need to do catheter care. Is that okay? I'm going to close your curtain, wash my hands, get my supplies, and I'll be right back. Okay, Ms. Jones, I'm going to gather my supplies. I'll start out with a barrier that provides a clean place to put my supplies. And we're going to get four washcloths, a towel, a chucks, a privacy blanket, and now I'll gather my basin and soap. And a set of gloves. All right, Ms. Jones, I'll just get some water. I'll be right back. Would you like to check the water temperature and make sure it's okay? It's good? Good. I'll place the washcloths in there to stay warm. And I'm going to cover you with a privacy blanket. This is going to help protect your privacy and keep you warm while we do this skill. sheet down to about your knees. Okay, Ms. Jones, I'm going to place this pad underneath you. This is going to help keep your bed dry while we do this skill. First, I'll roll it toward me. I'm 
place it on the bed. And then I'll put my gloves on. All right, Ms. Jones, can you scoot toward me, please? Thank you. And can you roll onto your left side? One, two, three. Thank you. I'm going to be very careful making sure that the catheter tubing rolls with the patient and doesn't get pulled on. I'm going to unroll the chucks underneath the patient's hip and have the patient come back onto their back, making sure that they don't lay on that catheter tubing. Ms. Jones, can you scoot to the middle of the bed, please? Thank you. Ms. Jones, can you scoot toward me? Thank you, and roll up onto your right side. One, two, three. And now I can unroll the chucks to protect the bed. Come on back, Ms. Jones, and scoot to the middle of the bed. Thank you very much. Okay, now I'm going to start cleaning the catheter. I'm going to roll your gown up inside the blanket. I will be exposing you, but we'll make this as brief as possible. Please let me know if you're uncomfortable. As I roll the gown in the blanket, I want to make sure that I don't grab the catheter, that we don't cause any unnecessary pulling or stress on that catheter. And now we'll cover her thighs with a towel. This exposes only the area that we're working on. I'm going to take the first washcloth and wring it out and apply soap to four leaves. One, two, three, four. Now I'm going to clean your catheter. I'm going to hold the catheter where it exits the body, wrap the washcloth around, and wipe away from the body. Fold that leaf over. I'm going to hold it, wrap the washcloth around, and wipe away from the body. That's two. We're going to do this two more times. Away from the body. Three. And the last one. Four. I'll set this washcloth aside. Whenever we wash, we must rinse. So I'll wring this washcloth out. And we'll use it to rinse that catheter the same way we washed. I'm going to hold it where it exits the body, wrap the washcloth around, and wipe away from the body. We'll do this four times. Two, three, and four. Set this aside. Now we'll dry the catheter. Now we're going to do peri care. We'll take a washcloth out of the basin, wring it out really well, and we're going to soak five corners. One, two, three, four, and the back side is five. Okay, now I'm going to clean the peri area. I'm going to lift the catheter up out of the way with my pinky and hold the labia open while I clean down the center with the first leaf, always going top to bottom, and then we'll remove the washcloth and fold that leaf over. Now I'm going to clean down one side of the labia, top to bottom, fold that leaf over, clean down the other side of the labia, top to bottom, fold that leaf over. I'm going to clean the skin fold between the groin and the leg, fold that leaf over, and clean the other skin fold between the groin and the leg, and then set that washcloth aside. I'm going to take the final washcloth and wring it out really well, and we're going to rinse all of those areas the same way that we wash them. So I'll hold that catheter out of the way and spread the labia open, cleaning down the center, top to bottom. Fold that leaf over, clean down one side of the labia, fold that leaf over, rinse down the other side of the labia, fold that leaf over. We're going to rinse the skin fold, fold that leaf over, and the other skin fold. Set that aside. Now we'll dry gently by patting dry top to bottom and then removing the towel. Ms. Jones, I'm going to cover you back up. I'll unroll that blanket, which will replace the gown over the patient. I'm going to make sure that the catheter and the tubing is coiled on the bed, not near the floor, and not where the patient is laying on it, making sure it's not kinked. 
Miss Jones, I'll be right back. I need to dispose of your supplies. The towels and washcloth will be placed in dirty linen. The basin is going to be clean the way we clean everything else. We'll return the basin to the drawer and on the way we'll pick up the soap. We'll open the drawer with the paper towel and return the basin to its storage area. Now I'll dispose of my paper towels. Okay, Ms. Jones, I need to remove the chucks from under you. Can I get you to scoot toward me, please? Thank you. And can I get you to roll up on your left side? One, two, three. Thank you. I'll roll this soiled chucks toward the patient and tuck it under her hip. Come on back, Ms. Jones, and scoot back to the middle, making sure the patient is not laying on that catheter tubing. Okay, Ms. Jones, can you scoot toward me again, please? Thank you, and roll up on your right side. And I'm gonna remove that chucks from the bed. Okay, you can scoot back to the middle, thank you. This is going to be thrown away. Okay, Ms. Jones, let me just look at your catheter one last time. Make sure that the catheter tubing is coiled on the bed, that the catheter is not on the floor. Everything looks good. I'm going to remove the chucks from the table, and we're going to throw this away, and then I'll remove my gloves. We'll throw those away. Okay, Ms. Jones, I'll pull your sheet up now. And I'll remove the blanket as I do so, rolling it into a ball. You put this in dirty linen. Okay, Ms. Jones, here's your call light. If you should need anything, just let me know. Are you comfortable? Can I get you anything while I'm here, like a magazine? I'm just gonna open your curtain and wash my hands. After washing my hands, I'll think about the steps of my skill, make any corrections that need to be made, and then tell the evaluator my skill is done. Okay, so we're going to go into emptying the drainage bed. Hello, Ms. Jones. My name is Patty. I'm your CNA today. How are you? Great. I need to empty your urinary drainage bag. Is that okay? Okay, I'm going to close your curtain, wash my hands, get my supplies, and I'll be right back. For this skill, I'll need a barrier, which I'll place on the floor under the drainage bag. I'm going to need a set of gloves. And I'm going to need a triangular graduate container. I want to inspect the catheter tubing to make sure that it's coiled on the bed and the patient isn't lying on it and it's not kinked, but also that it's not hanging near the floor where somebody might get their feet tangled up in it and trip or accidentally rip the catheter out. This catheter looks like it's in the appropriate position. We'll now remove the port from its protective sleeve on the bag. Sliding the valve to the side will open the port. We can now position this open port over the graduated container and tilt the bag slightly to the side to allow the contents to drain into the graduated container. While doing so, we want to be careful not to allow that port to touch any other surface. Once the urine bag has been emptied, we'll slide the port back to the side to close it 
and very carefully insert it back into its protective sleeve. We want to make sure that the bag is hanging on a non-movable part of the bed and it's not touching the floor. We can now fold the chucks over the graduate container for safe and secure transport to the patient's bathroom. Once we're at the patient's bathroom, we're going to set the graduate container down on a barrier on a flat surface and position it so that we can read it. We need to be at eye level and we're going to round to the nearest line, either up or down. You can see that the urine in this container is nearest to the mark of 425, so the amount that we will document is 425 milliliters or cc's. Once we've measured it on a barrier, on a flat surface, at eye level, we can now empty the urinary graduate container. We'll throw the barrier away, open up the toilet, and we're going to dump the contents of the graduate container into the toilet. Now we're going to rinse the graduate container. We'll deposit the rinse water into the toilet as well. Now we can clean. After dumping the rinse water into the toilet, we'll set it down, use a paper towel to pick it up, paper towel to dry the outside, paper towel to dry the inside, We'll discard this and then one for the drawer. We're going to place the graduate container in the bottom drawer and close the drawer with a paper towel. Okay, now I'll throw the paper towels away and remove my gloves. We'll throw those away as well. Thank you very much, Ms. Jones. Is there anything else I can get for you while I'm here? A magazine, perhaps? You have your call light there. If you should need anything at all, please feel free to let me know. I'm going to open your curtain, wash my hands, and document my skill. Thank you. After washing my hands, I'll document on the intake and output sheet that the evaluator gives me. I'm going to document the time of output, the type of output, which is urine, the amount of output in cc's, and my initials. After documenting, I'll review the steps of my skill, make any corrections, and then tell the evaluator my skill is done. All right, any questions on that? No? Okay, you have now had all of the skills um, demonstrated. So we're done with skills. Done with skills. All right, your homework tonight is chapter 10. Um, make sure that you read chapter 10. Remember the CPR class is not at 2 a.m., it's at 2 p.m. today. Um, and you do need to return your yellow book on Wednesday, so please make sure you bring that book on Wednesday. So I'm gonna go ahead and give you your review sheets. Um, Remember that you guys have the free ebook as well. And I know we talked about it earlier in the program, but I haven't brought it up lately. Um, Caitlin, can you uh, throw the link up for the ebook, please? So the ebook is on fouryearcna.com slash ebook. It's free. You can, yep, there it is. It's free. You can download it. Um, it will help you learn how to um, answer the questions that they're asking on the written exam. We also have a practice test in your book on page 191. So page 191 starts the practice test. This is very similar to what you would find on the state exam. It's 60 questions, multiple choice. The answer key is in the back. If you miss five or less on my test, the practice test, you're ready for the state exam. So if you miss five or less on the practice test, you're ready for the state exam. Okay. So does anybody have any questions for me?
on skills, on theory, on principles, on workplace, on anything. Do you have any questions for me? We have a resident um, on AL, not memory care, on AL, and she has cancer. Mm -hmm. And then I'm not a CNA. Am I allowed to clean her? Because I think she's not capable to clean her. You, know, you would have to look at your facility policies. But if, what if she was a, oh, okay, you are not, you're not a CNA, so I will not clean her. Well, you don't have to be a CNA to clean a catheter. Oh. Um, I teach family members to do it. We send patients home with catheters, and I teach family members to clean the catheters. So it's not that you have to be certified to perform this skill, but... I need to know what your facility will allow you to do. That's where you need to go to your policies and procedures. So facilities will lay out, you know, what to do. If a patient has a catheter, they have to be able to clean it themselves. Or if a patient has a catheter, staff um, that has been trained can clean it. Remember, you can't do anything you haven't been trained to do. So if you haven't been trained, then the answer is no, you can't clean it because you haven't been trained. So there's a lot of variables in there. I can't really answer that direct question for you because I don't know what their facility policy is. I don't know what licensing level they have. I don't know what training that they provide. I don't know any of that. So you would have to go find out through them. Some assisted living facilities have what they call a limited nursing license, which allows them to take on patients that have a higher acuity. Acuity means the level of care they need. Um, other uh, assisted living facilities are basic. They only provide personal care. Some are adult family care homes that can only provide um, very limited personal care. So I don't know how your facility is structured, what the policies are. There, there's a lot of variables, okay? But the, at the bottom of all of it is just one question. Have I been trained to do this? If the answer is no, it doesn't matter what setting you're in. It doesn't matter what license they have. If you haven't been trained, then no, you can't perform that. Okay. So that's really the question that, that is kind of at the bottom of everything. Have I been trained? Okay. Any others? Um, so for the test, we're doing three skills. Right. And the skills are on the yellow papers. Right. They're also in your book on page. Let me look it up. Twenty five. They're in your book on page 25. Okay. These are the exact same ones? Exact. Wow. Exact. So over years and years and years and years, I don't have them in here. Um, I had a whole drawer full of exam results from students. It was somewhere around 6,000 exam results. So I compiled them all, and that's how I got those. So what if I will fail for one skill? Then you fail the, the skills portion. You have to pass. It, it's, yep, it's simply pass-fail. You don't get partial credit. So if you fail one skill, you fail the entire skills exam. Now, if you pass the written and fail the skills, then all you have to do is retake the skills part. Right, right. You're going to do your opening, skill one, your closing, and say, my skill is done. And then they're probably going to take a brief, 10 second break to get everything set up for your next skill. 
So whether the patient's going to be in a chair or in bed, whether it's going to be a mannequin, um, they have to set the scene up for you. So it takes about 10 to 15 seconds to transition between. Once they get everything ready, they'll say, okay, you can begin whenever you're ready. And then you just say, I'm ready to start. Do your opening, skill two. Your closing, say, I'm done. They'll set up skill three. Your opening, skill three. Your closing, I'm done. Any others? Good questions. Good questions on the test. Uh, let's see here. Do you have notes for diabetic patient care? Um, I have a lecture on diabetes on, I think it's class four, um, but I don't have notes on diabetic care specifically. We kind of talk about that throughout the program. Um, and remember that care is going to be individualized to each particular patient. So diabetic care is not always going to be the same for every patient. But I do talk about diabetes. I think it's in class four. Wherever we do foot care, I talk about diabetes. All right. Any other questions? Last call. Do I have a registration copy? Sure. I'll have to print that out for you. Yeah. All right. Any others? Okay. We're going to go ahead and sign off for today. Make sure you tune in on Wednesday. We're going to talk about finding a job, uh, continuing education, how to renew. I'm going to give you an actual formula to answer the question during an interview. Tell me a little bit about yourself. There's a formula that you can use to craft your own answer um, and make you sound uh, really attractive to the um, employer. So that is a... Um, important part of Wednesday. Remember Wednesday, you want to bring your yellow book in. We will take a class photo as well. So please make sure you're in uniform. Um, all right. So until next time, guys, thank you for tuning in and we will see you on Wednesday. Happy caregiving. Bye.